All right, everybody. So we finally finished the ordinary differential equations. We did the first order, we did the second order, and higher order differential equations. Now the goal is to focus on the partial differential equations. Obviously, it will be a little bit more involved than the ordinary differential equations. Um, and actually, before I go ahead and solve partial differential equations, I need to cover a couple of materials like orthogonal functions, Fourier series, storm level problem. That's going to set the stage for me to solve partial differential equations. So that's what I'm starting in here now. Okay, but just just to give you a general idea about these orthogonal functions, um, I'm not sure you remember, but in calculus uh, we saw that a sufficiently differentiable function, let's say f of x, could be expanded in a Taylor series. Okay, and the Taylor series was infinite series of consisting of powers of x. Okay, um, so now we're going to change these powers of x. Actually. Fourier looked into this and he expanded the function in, certain, in terms of a trigonometric functions as opposed to the you know powers of x right so that we, we will need to cover the Fourier series the Fourier cosine the Fourier sine complex Fourier series so we are going to need those okay but also it's kind of interesting to note that after we looked into this we find out that this Fourier series is nothing but a, a special case of orthogonal functions Okay, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to first focus on the orthogonal functions, explain that in detail to you, then I'll look at a special case of orthogonal functions called the Fourier series. Okay, let's first start with looking at something called inner or dot product. You are familiar with this. And let's call, actually the first goal that I want to have is looking at a two particular vectors. And arbitrarily I call one of them u, one of them v. Okay. Let's call u1i plus u2j plus u3k. Okay, I'll do the same. v1i plus v2j plus v3k. Right. So now here's the thing, though. Um, do you remember what these were? i, j, k. So i is the unit vector in the x direction. J is the unit vector in the y direction. K is the unit vector in the z direction. Okay. The other thing is, as this is a vector, we have covered in our physics and other applied mathematics courses multiple cases of vectors. I'll give you one from my specialty area. Let's say this is velocity. This will be the velocity in the x, velocity in the y, velocity in the z directions. Okay. Um, but when we do is this inner product, again, I'll give you an example from fluid mechanics. We had this v dotted with n, right? Um, so the v is velocity in that particular case, so the v was this u, and this lowercase v vector was a normal to the surface, right? So we come across these often. Um, and I want to just represent what it is. So if I have u, and this is represented this way, or you can put a dot as well, just to highlight how I put it before. So you can have u1v1 plus u2v2 plus u3v3. I think you know this already, okay? So you, you know this already. But I can also represent this this way, a summation sign from k is equal to 1 to 3, u, k, v, k, right? So this multiplication will give me the dot product. So is this going to be a scalar or is this going to be a vector the end product? You know, I have a dot product over here, so I'm dotting at two vectors. What I'm going to obtain, you can see here is I'm, I'm multiplying a bunch of numbers and adding them up together. So obviously, I'm going to get a scalar or a, you know, a real number. So what I want to do now is I want to look at the um, properties of these. You may not see the connection to the orthogonal functions just yet. I'm getting there. I'm just reminding you these inner or dot products before I go to the functions. Okay? Vectors are much more manageable and much more familiar to you. And then I'll go to the functions and that will be related to orthogonal functions. All right? So let's continue. So let's look at the properties. of inner product okay the, the good thing about these inner products is as things are kind of uh, you know straightforward and simple the properties will be making sense to you okay so I have this I'll, I'll give I'll ask you a question okay let's say the uh, inner product of u and v uh, and let's say that I have v and u do you think I can interchange the order well, yeah, right? It doesn't matter whether it's v1, u1, or u1, v1, right? At the end, it's the same number, and I sum them up. So this will be equal to each other, okay? Something to note. Let's look at the second one. 
And the second one, if I have the one of the vectors, I multiply by a scalar of k. And if I do that, you can kind of see in here now that you know there will be k here, there'll be k here, there'll be k here. I can factor out the k, so you can see this will be the k times u v like this, right? And the third one is a little bit different. Now, on what I'm looking at, I'm looking at the inner product of the same vector like this. Okay. So what will happen is if this is zero, what do you think uh, is each vector? Well, then if you know because uh, looking in here, how can I obtain, you know, I multiply two numbers and I sum them up, right? How can I obtain zero? And if this is not the case, um, he, the vector is not zero, then I'm going to get something larger than zero, right? And let's write here, u is not zero, not zero, right? It's kind of important. And the last one uh, is, uh, let's write it, then I'll talk. So I simply sum up two vectors and I dot product the, or inner product it with a uh, the third vector, I can simply do this, u, w, plus b, w, right? So you can see from here, you know, looking at in here, so you kind of see that u plus v, so I can distribute it this way, right? This and that. Okay, so so far what I've covered is just the vectors, right? So this is not quite relevant to what I, I, I need to accomplish. So now I'm going to change the tone a bit. Still, it will be related to this, but my goal now is to look at the, let's say I have two, I'll generalize to infinite uh, coming up, okay? But for now, let's say I have two piecewise continuous functions, okay? So it's a piecewise continuous functions, and I'm going to abbreviate them f1 and f2. And now it will be extremely important for us to define the interval, okay? So you will see that it will, uh, interval will change everything, okay? And the inner product of these two functions now can be defined by this. As remember, these are continuous. So instead of summing, I'm still summing, but I'm looking at the integral. That's what the definition of integral is, right? From A to B, you can see this uh, before I go ahead. This A is this, B is that. So that's why it's very important. And now I'm going to have f1 of x, f2 of x times dx. This will be the inner product of two functions, right? So let's go ahead and write a good uh, definition of uh, orthogonality, right? So let's go out with the vectors first. I have two vectors and let's say that one is u, one is v, right? Are orthogonal and it's orthogonal also sometimes is called perpendicular for vectors when this dot product u, v is zero. I go back over here, I gave this example, and I'll tell you something about it. This V is velocity. If the velocity is tangent to the surface, and this N is pointing away from the surface, angle between the velocity and the normal will be 90 degrees, so then that will be zero. You may remember this from fluid mechanics. We use this when we're doing the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Okay? A very fundamental uh, applied physics topics. So I can have, in a similar fashion to this particular one, right? I can have this. Now, f1 and f2 are orthogonal in a particular interval a, b, if I have this f1, f2 will be a, b, it's up there, f1 of x, f2 of x, dx is equal to zero, right? It's the same thing, the inner product is defined this way for functions. If this is equal to zero, these two functions are orthogonal. Very important that unlike the vectors that I was giving an example of, this doesn't have any geometric significance, okay? So the two vectors, if they're orthogonal, it means that they're perpendicular or 90 degree to each other, right? But the functions doesn't have any geometric significance as far as the orthogonality is concerned. Let me give you a simple example of, um, you know, functions because that's the direction that I wanna go into. Let's say that f1x is equal to, well, x, right? And f2x is, let's say, call it x squared. And I'll investigate two different intervals. One will be minus 2 to 2, and I will also investigate 0 to 2. Okay? Let's see whether they're orthogonal or not in these two particular intervals that I picked. Okay? So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this, right? It's right up there. So I'm going to repeat myself. And f1, f2, this will give me the orthogonality condition. Uh, let's look at uh, a will be what? 
minus 2 in this first part instance to 2. Then I will, re you know, I'm looking at this. Then I will go to 0 to 2 as well. I will repeat myself. Okay? So it will be x times x squared. f1 is x, f2 is x squared times dx. So this becomes x cubed, right? And so from here, a simple uh, integral will give me x to the power of 4 divided by 4. And this will be 2 to minus 2. So now if I plug the numbers in for this particular interval, I will get myself 2 to the power of 4 minus minus 2 to the power of 4. So you kind of see here that 2 to the power of 4 is 16. Minus 2 to the power of 4 is also 16, right? So I get myself 0. So then this function and this function is orthogonal if my interval is this. Okay? If I do the same treatment for 0 to 2, what I will get now is I will still get the same as this, right? Right? Except the um, limits of the integration will be different. Let's say um, 0 to 2, right? I'm right? You know you know this, but I'm just repeating that I write the smaller number here, mathematically speaking, larger number over here, right? FYI. So now in this particular case, I will get 2 to the power of 4 is 16 minus 0. So I get myself a non-zero value. So that simply indicates that, no, this is not orthogonal in this particular interval. Okay, so far I did for two functions. So let's look at the set of functions. It doesn't have to be two, okay? And I can generalize this to number infinity, okay? So let's say that I have a set of functions and I can simply express them as phi zero of x, phi one of x, phi two of x, and it can go all the way, right? So this is orthogonal in a, b. Again, interval is very important. I made my point very clearly. If I have this phi m, phi n, so m is not equal to n in this particular case, is equal to a, b, phi m of x, phi n of x, dx is equal to 0, m is not equal to n. Okay? If this is satisfied for all m and n values, right? The other thing is, if um, now I'm going to go back to the vectors, but we have a norm or the length of a vector. Do you remember that? Norm or a length of a vector. And that was, uh, you know, so we ex express this this way, not to confuse with the absolute sign. If I have a norm, let's call this norm, or length of a particular vector. And for that one, if you remember, this was u1 square plus u2 square plus u3 square, right? Square root of it. So this was my norm or length. If I go back all the way here, isn't this the inner product? You know, u1 times u1, u1 square plus u2 times. So it's the inner product with itself, right? So I'm going to write that over here. So let's write this over here. So that means that this is the square root of u comma u, right? But also sometimes we use the square norm. So this is why basically as the name very well recommends you, I will get myself u1 square, u2 square plus u3 square without having any square root of it. Okay, so it's just itself. Okay, so far I did this for vectors. Now let's do it for the functions. So I have an infinite set of functions. Then the square norm of it will be this phi n, phi n itself, before it was m and n, now n and n, right? Because I'm just doubling itself. So I will get myself a to b phi n square x dx. So basically phi n times phi n, right? So I simply write phi n squared just to save some time, okay? Or if I have norm or length, I will have this time around phi n without the square in it. So that will be this, right? phi n, phi n, and then I have the square root of it. So you can see up there, so I'm going to take the square root of this whole thing. So let's write it this way, a to b, phi n square x dx, and I have the square root over here, right? So just want to highlight, and because I received this question when I teach in class, um, is that, hey, you have a square root over here, I have a square in here, can I simply go ahead and cancel them out? Um, in some cases, yes, but that's not the that's not true in general. In general, this is not the case. All right. Actually, let me go ahead and write this. This is kind of important. Um, so this 
I have this as phi n a to b x squared dx this is not equal to let's write this a to b phi n of x okay dx so these are not the same in general all right so this uh, kind of finishes the first uh, uh, part of the orthogonal functions i'll come back with a kind of a uh, detailed uh, example of how to take this um, orthogonality of functions and i also will discuss the norm and the square norm of it Thank you for watching this.